What kind of treasures can we find when we study the book of Esther in Biblical Hebrew? Hi, I'm Doug, and I want to encourage you in studying the biblical languages. Today, we want to talk about five insights into Esther from studying biblical Hebrew, and this recording is being made on Purim 2024. So as we look at the book of Esther, there are some things that we can look at as beginners, as intermediate students, as advanced students. You can use websites like safaria.org, stepbible.org to get started no matter where you are on your journey into gleaning some insights from the Hebrew of Esther. So five insights. Number one, characterization and intertextuality. Now, what are we talking about? Those are two big words. Characterization, we're talking about the way the characters in a narrative, in this case, are described and portrayed. So the description, the actions they perform, the responses they give, things like that are very important. Intertextuality refers to the usage of language that is drawn from earlier texts in later texts. And both of these things are important in the book of Esther, and you have to read closely and carefully to pick up on them. Now, as for characterization, we see Esther. She is described in a unique way. The text says in Esther 2, 7, that Esther is Yafat to'ar vetovat mar'e. Now, what is Yafat to'ar and Vitova Mar'e. The physical description is that Esther has a beautiful form and a pleasing appearance. Now, she's not the first person to be described in the Bible in terms of a commendation of physical appearance, although she is unique in having these particular groupings of words put together in this particular construction. Let's think, who else, intertextually, who else could this be reminding us of? We think of the matriarchs, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, go back and check out their descriptions. There are some things that they have in common with this description in Esther. We see not uh, only uh, the matriarchs, but we see one of their children, Rachel's son, Joseph, is described in almost identical language with the same root words being used to describe his appearance. We see descriptions also, for example, with David, with David's daughter, Tamar. And we see Vashti in the book of Esther also uh, being given a description that commends uh, her beauty. And so this is an interesting part of the characterization in the book of Esther. By having Esther described in such a way, we know she is a very key character and that something is going to happen in regard to Esther's beauty. Another instance of characterization and intertextuality, the way Mordecai and Haman are introduced. We learn uh, that Mordecai, intertextually, shares lineage with Saul, the first king of Israel. And we learn that Haman is an Agagite. Now, there's no accident there. Intertextually, that recalls 1 Samuel 15, where Agag, the king of the Amalekites, has been spared by Saul and Samuel executes him. But there is a connection being drawn here between the book of Esther and the events of 1 Samuel, and that's going to be very important for the tension in the narrative going forward. So these are some amazing examples of characterization and intertextuality that you can pick up on as you study the book of Esther. And yes, you can see this in translation, but you see it more vividly in high definition when you are studying it in biblical Hebrew. The second avenue of insight into the book of Esther involves noticing the layout in the manuscript tradition. And the biblical Hebrew paratext is what we're talking about here. We did a whole episode on paratext, and in short, we're talking about those elements on the page that are not the text itself, but the way it's arranged and laid out. And when you look at manuscripts of the book of Esther, if you look at Codex Leningrad, if you look at uh, Magilat uh, Esther, you will see the names of Haman's sons. You will see Ve'et, which is a vav, a conjunction with the definite direct object marker on the left edge. And then the next line will have that object being a name of one of Haman's sons. And it talks about how they were killed, but it lists them, Ve'et and the name, Ve'et and the name, 10 times all the way down. And it visually pictures, to use the words of Dr. Thea Gomolari, to whom I must give a couple of hat tips today, um, it is a visual midrash. So they are giving a commentary 
by virtue of the way they've copied this text. And you can see, for instance, how in one manuscript here, we have an entire page dedicated to this. Now, this is important, and there's probably some intertextuality going on here, too, because in the manuscript tradition, the 31 kings that were conquered in Joshua chapter 12 are listed in a similar manner. And then you've also got the whole connection with Saul and Agag uh, and the situation with the Amalekites in 1 Samuel 15, and then the death of Saul and his sons who were uh, were publicly displayed on a tree like this like Haman and his sons there are some amazing connections that are drawn out by paying attention simply to the layout of the manuscript and how that's being highlighted a third avenue of gathering insights into the book of Esther is to observe the textual divisions this again is an element of paratext and has to do with the arrangement of the text in this case segmenting it with spaces and dividing uh, it into smaller chunks, smaller units. And one interesting example here is the ending of the book. Instead of keeping the final three verses with what precedes, verses one through three are separated. Now, we don't always know the reason these are separated, but it's worth noticing when you see these textual divisions, it's worth asking, what does this produce for the reader? What does this highlight? What does this emphasize? According to Goswell, one way we could look at this aspect of the scribal tradition is that some wanted to downplay the role of Esther and elevate Mordecai a bit more in the book. He writes, this way of partitioning the text could be understood as an attempt to make Mordecai the sole hero of the book. I'm not offering the last answer on this by any means, but as I mentioned, you can get some insights at least into how people understood the text in grouping it in these ways, and it can make you pay attention to some aspects of the book that you might not have noticed otherwise. A fourth avenue of collecting insights of study from the book of Esther involves doing lexical studies. So if you want to check out how a word is used throughout Esther, there are amazing connections that you can see across the book. There are also intertextual connections, once again, and you can look at roots like Nun, Sade, Lamed in Esther 4.14, it talks about how deliverance uh, would come from another place if Esther doesn't uh, proceed according to the plan Mordecai is suggesting. That is a noun from that root, but when you look up that root and you find all the instances of the verb, uh, not sol, to deliver, then it's an amazing thing to see people snatching things and maybe animals and so forth. But there are many, many, many passages that talk about Yahweh delivering his people. And so it's a common thing to find this route throughout Samuel, throughout Psalms, but also even back in the book of Judges with the deliverances that are done there. And there are other places in the Hebrew Bible as well. I'll leave that to you to further investigate. Just want to give you some hints here today. And uh, anytime you see something in the text that you think is some kind of a, a key word, check out how it's being used throughout that book. Check out how it's being used in some other passages. And in Esther 4.14 in particular, if this is an intertextual reference, maybe it's a subtle way of bringing in some other themes that are not explicitly given to us in the book of Esther. You notice when you study the book in Hebrew, there's no Elohim, no Yahweh to be found explicitly mentioned in the book. But the lexical studies of the words that are in the book can give some potential connections, perhaps, that might connect to that theme. They can also show you some things about the inner workings of the book itself. And I want to just go ahead and transition from this into our fifth insight, because it involves looking at not just one word, but looking at groups of words and patterns of words, particularly the structure of the book as a whole, and thinking of Esther as a chiastic structure. Now, We've got to be careful. There are some people who have a, a chiasm mania and see these everywhere, but we shouldn't go to the other extreme and pretend they don't exist even on large levels within major sections or entire books. Now, one resource I'd recommend that talks about the chiastic structure sum is Karen Job's commentary, the NIV application commentary on Esther. Now, Job's is a top-notch scholar who has expertise in the Hebrew and Greek versions of Esther, and she talks about different aspects of the reversals in the book of Esther. And the chiastic structure idea, that is the epitome of a reversal because it is a reverse symmetry where you will have elements that precede a center point at which everything changes and then starts moving into reverse. 
and she gives three diagrams. One is about banquets and feasting in Esther, where there are two banquets that begin and end the book. You have Xerxes' uh, banquet for the nobles of the empire, and then for all the men in Susa. And then the book ends with a first and second day of feasting with Purim. And then the next level would be Esther's coronation banquet, which is matched by a feasting and celebration of Mordecai's promotion. And then in the center, you have the two banquets given by Esther for the king and Haman. So there are some interesting symmetries there. And then I'm going to just mention a few of these and uh, leave these for you to check out if you want to look more in more detail. She has a chart of chiastic structures of reversals in Esther. For example, in 310, the king gives Haman his ring, and in 82, the king gives Mordecai the same ring. In 312, Haman summons the king's scribes, and in 89, Mordecai summons the king's scribes. There are many examples she gives here. Mordecai wears sackcloth in 4.1, and then Mordecai wears royal robes in 8.15. There are examples that you could take from a chart like this, and you could look up the words using a resource like stepbible.org. You could see if they're mirrored with the exact language. That's one of the things about studying chiastic structures. You can have thematic uh, chiasms. Those can be a little harder to prove at times, but when you have exact lexical matches of words, and especially of, of phrases, uh, if you have opposites, in meaning, maybe you have the same verb, but you've got a different subject. You've got people who are obviously uh, in stark contrast, like Haman and Mordecai. In this instance, the chiastic structure can, can highlight and bring out some of those major differences and definitely show us a reversal. Uh, she has another chart on the literary structure of Esther with the two banquets bookending the um, the work, the king celebrating two banquets, and then the Jews celebrating two feast days, and then Esther's first and second banquets in the middle, and then the turning point in chapter 6, when the king cannot sleep. It's sleepless in Susa, and then the whole plot of Haman unravels, and everything is going bad <laughs> for him from then on, and things are going to work out for the Jews in the book. There are some amazing things to see in the book of Esther, many, many more insights. We've hardly scratched the surface, and I hope you will check into some of those. Now, with that lack of mention of God and no appearance of the divine name in the book of Esther as such, we should mention a couple more things. So as a bonus, a couple more hat tips here. First, a hat tip again to Dr. Thea Gomalari, who let me know about a presentation by Professor Ignacio Carbajosa concerning Magilat Esther, uh, subtitled How to Find a Needle in a Haystack. Uh, Professor Carbajosa points out that there's a manuscript from Madrid that has some special markings over letters that occur on four consecutive words. Those letters are Yod, He, Vav and hey, four consecutive words, Esther 5, verse 4, begin with each of those letters in sequence. So one word begins with yod, the next begins with hey, the next begins with vav, the next begins with hey. And then in chapter 7, verse 7, he also points out that there are words that end in the same sequence. So you have the four words ending, the first with yod, the second with hey, the third with vav, and the fourth with hey. And so some think that maybe Esther has the divine name hiding right there under the surface in those sequences of letters. I will leave that for you to explore and to investigate further. It's certainly an interesting uh, and attractive um, idea that the words could have intentionally been placed in such a way. But this has uh, certainly been something that has been a conundrum for people for uh for, well, millennia now. And if you go back to the earliest uh, traditions of, of Esther outside of Biblical Hebrew, looking at the Greek versions of Esther, you can see in Greek Esther expansions, you can see details about calls for prayer, mention of the Lord God that are not in the Hebrew text, possibly uh, because people were uncomfortable with a Hebrew text that did not directly mention God. If you'd like to study that further, i got to give a hat tip to Joshua Alfaro. Thank you, Joshua, for reminding me recently on an online forum, replying to somebody else, but I read those too, uh, that Karen Jobes, who wrote the NIV application commentary, also wrote the introduction to the New English translation of the Septuagint on Esther, and that's available freely online. And this is Jobes' wheelhouse. This is what she did her doctoral work on, so she's a great source for that if you want to get started studying the Greek versions of Esther in addition to the Hebrew. 
But however you proceed, uh, studying Esther, studying other books, I hope you will stay at it and keep moving forward with your study of the biblical languages. And I hope you are seeing that there are many wonderful benefits to reading the Bible in high definition. What kind of treasures can you find when you study a book of the Bible in the original languages?